So let's get started talking about this amazing continent of Australia. The geologic history is really a study in contradictions. What we see are some of the oldest features in the world, along with some incredibly new rock features, which are still in the process of formation today. The continent has rocks dating from more than 3,000 million years. I don't even know how that competes in my mind. 3,000 million years, while others are from vol volcanic activity from only a few thousand years ago. And that's what's extreme about this continent, is almost everything about it is a study in extremes and contradictions. You'll see new things that are happening uh, in geologic formations, as well as these incredibly old structures that date back millions and millions of years. The shape of Australia is largely due to tectonic plates, to tectonic earth movements, and long-term changes in sea levels. But most of the topography of the land is caused by wind and water erosion. In fact, almost 50% of Australia's rivers often drain inland and end in salt lakes. Australia began its journey across the surface of the earth as an isolated continent about 55 to 10 million years ago and continues to new, move north by about 7 centimeters each year. Australia's present topography was determined by the Permian period about 300 million years ago when Australia was very near the South Pole and much of the continent was glaciated by large ice caps. So what you're going to see as this incredibly dry, hot continent was at one time located at the South Pole and was covered in ice. By the early Cretaceous period, Australia was already so flat and so low that a major rise in sea level divided the country into three land masses and that people were able to then cross much later using these shallow seas. The past few, few million years resulted in various glacial and interglacial periods, and the last glacial period was 20,000 years ago. So when we're thinking in terms of this geologic history of 55 million years, there was ice in Australia 20,000 years ago. That's not that long at all when we think about it. And by 11,700 years ago, this ice retreated and rising sea level separated mainland Australia from Tasmania and from New Guinea. And we'll show that in a little bit. The landforms of today are the result of prolonged, continuous process of movement and erosion over millions of years, giving rise to an incredible variety of landscapes throughout Australia. And these landscapes continue to change. People who were there 30 and 40 years ago will come back and say, boy, this, this looks a little bit different. Uh, and it is, it's constantly changing. Not that our eyes can perceive it oftentimes, but the continent is constantly changing. Now we're going to talk about the period of ancient Australia. And this is the period that describes the time from when the humans first arrived in Australia to the time of the first European explorers. So we're talking about a period of about 55 to 70,000 years ago until relatively modern time in 1606. Aboriginal Australians first came to the continent from Southeast Asia about 50 to 70,000 years ago. The Pleistocene era is one of the largest glacial, it was one of the largest geological periods that goes from 2.5 million years ago to 11,000 years, 11,700 years ago, which marks the ends of the last ice age. And so this corresponds now with what we would call the old stone age. So Paleolithic versus Neolithic, which is the new stone age. During the Pleistocene period, sea levels were much lower than they are today, and this would have made migration from Southeast Asia, from the land masses of New Guinea into Australia, would have made it much easier than it is now. Long sea crossings could have been made, but we know that they could have covered at least distances of 90 to 100 kilometers of open sea. They probably used rafts made of bamboo and other woods from the areas, and they would have been the world's first ocean travelers. 
we're not talking about just a few thousand years ago. We're talking about 50 to 70,000 years ago that these people would have crossed these shallow seas, and some of them quite deep seas, and they would have crossed from these northern land masses into what we know as Australia today. And here you can take a good look and to see how these land masses are connected. So you can see the land bridge between Australia and New Guinea was blocked by rising sea levels about 8,000 years ago. And so about 50 to 70,000 years ago, they would have been able to, uh, to, to come from Africa, cross over, and come through these land bridges. And then as the water started to rise, it blocked them. It stopped them from going back again. It stopped further travel. But you can see here all the way down to the bottom how that would have been connected, the southern part of Australia connected to Tasmania, how Kangaroo Island would have also been connected to the mainland, and how this land bridge would have connected all the way up to New Guinea. So this makes Aboriginal Australians one of the oldest indigenous peoples outside of Africa. They also are remarkable because they had the oldest continuous culture. Migration to Australia stopped about 50,000 years ago. And the people here developed in isolation to the rest of the world. So what we have here is remarkable in the sense that they started their migration about 70 to 50,000 years ago, and then they stopped. Most other places in the world, we see a continuous migration of people out of Africa, and we see continuous migration patterns across Europe and into Asia. And here in Australia, we see that it stopped 50,000 years ago. And so what, that, what happened then is these people developed in isolation. Their culture continued to develop. Their Bodies, their, their entire genetic structures continue to develop according to the land and their needs for a 50,000 year period. And that's what makes this culture such a remarkable study in almost every aspect possible. The Australian Aboriginal population is one of the oldest continuous cultures in the world. So the artistic and the musical and the spiritual traditions are so interesting because we know that they stopped having an influence 50,000 years ago. There's no other culture that we can imagine that stopped having an influence 50,000 years ago. So when we look at these cultures, even in Africa, cultures were coming in and out. But here now in Australia, we see a culture that's completely isolated for the past 50,000 years. And so when we take a look at their their societal structures, when we take a look at their stories, they really become an interesting study for cultural anthropologists. Aboriginal artifacts on Rottnest Island have been dated from 6,500 years ago to more than 30,000 years. However, more recent evidence suggests human, human occupation from 50 to 70,000 years ago. And there's also some areas uh, of human habitation in Australia that date back to 55,000 years. The earliest human remains were found at Lake Mungo, which are 40,000 years old. And bones of people from this period of time show that they were more robust people, that these were a strong, hardy people who were able to weather the climate and the changes at that time, even more physically varied than people are today. So that's what's really unique and interesting is that we see large numbers of variances in these migratory patterns as they came into Australia. The first Australians had dark skin and black hair. Most of them were hunter-gatherers. They would have followed animal migration. They would have gathered plants along the way. They were nomadic peoples, very similar to what we would find today in, say, the Amazon basin. Uh, these are people who would follow the animal migrations. They would follow these paths, and they would have continued to follow them until these animals would have stopped or, or until they would have depleted the animal sources. They developed into different ethnic groups, and each group had its own language and traditions. And so in 1788, when the British first started arriving and colonizing, it's estimated that there were 500 to 900 separate language groups in Australia. Imagine that, 500 to, to 900 distinct language groups when they arrived just 200 years ago. Each of these language groups was made of even smaller groupings, which may have even had 
further dialectical changes. And these groups then often got together and combined for ceremonial and trade activities. Consider that it seems like a lot, 500 to 900 different groups, but when we're talking about a continent that's roughly the same size as the United States or the roughly the same size as the continent of Europe, think about how spread out these people must have been. And so consequently for us now, it makes it difficult for any student of these cultures to say definitively, this is Aboriginal culture. Or when we see one group, we would say, hey, this is representative of Aboriginal culture. We really can't say that because we don't know, because there are so many varied groupings here. What we have to take a look at as the larger, is the larger features and how all of these groups fit together into a bigger picture. It's possible that at the time of the European arrival, that there was a population of 750,000 Aborigines at this time. So consider how remarkable that was. And so when people talk about not having a culture or wanting to dismiss Aboriginal culture or denigrate it, we're talking about a significant population of three quarters of a million people. And you don't get to that type of size of population without some level of hierarchy and organization. It's simply understood and implicit in this kind of number that there are high levels of organization. Maybe we don't understand them because the language barriers were so difficult to overcome, but they were quickly decimated after European arrival, so we never really got to study. Many of these languages are now since gone. Archaeologists found that the use of fires increased with the arrival of the first Aboriginal peoples. Hunter-gatherers used fire as a tool to drive game, to be able to clear growth, and to attract animals. They also used it uh, for many other purposes, obviously for firewood as well. So dense open forests became open forests, and open forest became grassland. And species that could survive now started to take over, in particular, eucalyptus, the acacia, the blue gum, and the grasses. And so what we'll see today is that these plants now really are dominant plant life in Australia. Really interesting at this period of time is that megafauna were even, changes to megafauna were even more dramatic. Species much larger than humans disappeared. So when the Aborigines first came 50 to 70,000 years ago, they would have encountered large megafauna species as well as smaller species. There would have been about 60 different vertebrates that became extinct, including the Diprotodon, which is a very large marsupial that looks like a hippo, several large flightless birds. Imagine this, meat-eating kangaroos. They don't seem quite so cuddly anymore, do they? Yeah, meat-eating kangaroos, a five-meter lizard, and uh, myolania, a tortoise the size of a small car. So we think about these things and say in, uh, in the Galapagos Islands, for those of you who have been able to go there and see those, the, the land tortoises there, we see here now a tortoise that would have been even larger than the tortoises on the, in the Galapagos. So the direct cause of the mass extinctions uh, for this megafauna is uncertain. It may have been fire, hunting, climate change. Um, it may have been a combination of any of these factors. But without lar large herbivores to eat the vegetation, extra fuel made fires burn hotter, further changing the landscape. And Australia became drier, hotter, and experienced less rainfall. In the period from 18,000 to 15,000 years ago, Australia became drier with much hotter temperatures and less rainfall. Between 16 and 14,000 years ago, the sea levels rose quickly, and it may have risen 50 feet in 300 years. So let's consider that for a moment, that we already know that this is a cycle that happens in the, on a global scale. That over 300 year period of time, the sea levels rose 50 feet, dramatically transforming the world as the early Australians knew it. About 13,000 years ago, rising sea levels separated Australia from New Guinea and also separated Victoria from Tasmania in the south. Kangaroo Island, off the, off the coast of Adelaide, was also then at that time separated by water. Now we'll chat briefly about Aboriginal culture and some of the cave paintings. 
Aboriginal culture is an oral tradition culture. They did not develop a system of writing or written communications. However, they committed, communicated their history through a strong oral tradition, through their songs, through their song lines, their dreaming, and they also painted for us pictures on rock and bark. Sadly, none of the bark uh, drawings uh, are still around today, but we still do have many examples of remarkable rock paintings throughout Australia. Some paintings showing megafauna that became extinct 40,000 years ago. So what do we know? Either this was passed down through generations, the story of this megafauna that was later drawn onto these rocks, and some of these paintings uh, obviously show them the strength of this oral tradition. And these paintings are among the oldest known paintings in the world, similar to the caves in Lascaux uh, in, uh, in France. Homo sapiens evolved in Africa some 200,000 years ago. But although these humans looked like us, the struggle is to understand whether or not they thought like us. And this brings some really interesting questions, right? We know that they looked like us. They had similar shape and form. But what did they think? We really can't know about that. So we just, it's conjecture mostly. But what we can start to do is to think about the world in which they lived, what their necessities were, what their relationships might have been, and how they would have thought. So intellectual breakthroughs such as tool making were mastered by human ancestors more than one million years ago. But what sets us apart is our ability to think, to plan for the future, and here's what's really important, to learn from the past, to learn from our mistakes. Although more and more that we discover, animals have the same ability, not just humans. Animals are also able to learn from their past mistakes and to continue to make changes that guide their decisions. But theories of early human co co cognition call this higher order consciousness. How do we know what they thought about and how they thought? Such competitive thinking and sophisticated thinking was a competitive advantage for these people, helping us to cooperate and to survive in harsh environments and really helping them colonize these new lands that they had no knowledge about. It also opened the door, and here's where it becomes interesting. It opened the door to imaginary realms, to the spirit world, and infused their minds with connections to these lands. What's interesting is to see that these people now besides just this goal and desire to survive, we're thinking about what lies beyond. They started to understand their mortality, and they started to wonder, what happens after we die? We know that we do die, that not all things live, and that we can take life, and that we can give life, but what happens beyond that? And then when they start to think about that, they think about, where do we come from? How did we become? And again, these same stories that are asked and same questions that are asked all over the world were asked by these people as well. This idea of thinking about the spirit world enabled symbolic thinking, our idea to let one thing stand for another. And it allowed people to make visual representations that they could remember and imagine. So now they would see an animal or they would recall a story and they would want to share this with successive generations. And so they would make a painting on the cave wall and they would bring their children in and they would teach them the stories of their ancestors. And as there were animals that were roaming about and they would eat and hunt those animals, they would teach their children about these animals as well. And for those of you who get a chance to see the rock formations in northern Australia with the hand prints on the wall, what you'll see here is generation after generation after generation putting water on the wall, putting their hands up against it, and then with ochre in their other hand, <laughs> blowing this ochre so that it would go on the wall and record their presence in that place for all time. They really wanted people to know and understand that they were a generational people, that they were a people who believed in their past and that by understanding their past, that they would have a better future. 
And so they built this better future for their children. Ancient art is a marker for this cognitive shift and this ability to understand it, to make representative drawings. Encountering early paintings, particularly figurative representatives, shows us evidence for the evolution of the modern human mind. Aboriginal people also had a very strong spirituality. They believed that everything came from the dream time and that the earth itself was sacred. Keep in mind how this is different from what many of us believe and that many of us through our Judeo-Christian concepts believe that the world maybe not, is not necessarily sacred, but that God created humans to dominate and to subjugate. And so it gave us priority. It gave us preference in this world that we live in. The Aborigines don't believe that. They believe that they are one with the earth and that they must maintain and, ma and keep the earth for their own use, but that they're just a part of this cycle and that all of these things come from ancient spirits, ancestor spirits. And again, we see this idea of the rainbow serpent. We'll talk more about this in the next lecture where we discuss in detail some of the aboriginal mythologies. But this rainbow serpent now is not a negative creature. It's not an evil creature. The rainbow serpent here is the creator God. And so these customs and these beliefs are passed down through the dream time over generations and generations. What makes it truly remarkable is that unlike many of our faiths, which are marked in time, all faiths are about a given people in a given place in a given time. If you change the people, if you change the place, or you change the time, you change the story. You change the entire meaning of the story. These people understood that. And so they continued to pass these stories down orally, generation after generation, making necessary changes, adapting their stories to help the next generation understand it. So it's similar to the stories that maybe our parents told us and their grandparents told them, that we change these stories slightly to help our children understand. And that's so important with this idea of mythology that it continues to be representative of the time and the place and the people that are hearing it so that it becomes relevant and pertinent to their lives. Now we'll talk briefly about the European arrival. There's, it's in, we don't have enough time really to talk about all of the people who landed on Australia's shores. So we'll talk briefly about some of the early ones and then the ones that we know and understand. Prior to documented history, travelers from Asia may have reached Australia. China's control of, the, of South Asian waters would have extended possibly to a landing in Australia in the early 15th century. Likewise, Muslim voyagers uh, came within 300 miles of Australia. So they didn't see the land, but they know that they came within 300 miles of the shores. Again, adventure being off course may have carried some other people the distance to these shores. And both Chinese and Arab documents tell about a southern land they aren't able to discuss it in any sort of accuracy to lead us to believe that it might have been Australia. But what we know is that the name comes from Terra Australis, which means the southern land. And so they knew that there was this Terra Australis incognita, this hidden or undiscovered southern land. Portuguese may have visited Australia in 1528 and may have even taken slaves from Melville Island in the north. The Spanish again reached New Hebrides in December of 1605 and named the island Australia del Espiritu Santo, so the southern land of the Holy Spirit. However, they failed to sight Australia and return home. So imagine these people came within 300 miles of seeing <laughs> this remarkable continent and they ended up turning home having discovered really nothing except for small islands that were distant from the mainland. The Dutch arrived in 1605 and it continued to explore the coast through 1644, naming it New Holland. And then the British began to arrive in 1688, leading to Captain James Cook in Botany Bay in 1770. Why Australia? We have a whole bunch of Americans in here, right? Why did they choose Australia? Well, it has a good deal to do with our independence. By 1770, Britain was shipping 1,000 prisoners a year, mostly to their colonies in Maryland and Virginia. 
a total of 50,000 convicts were sent to the colonies. In fact, one out of every four British immigrants came to America during the 18th century was a transported felon. Next to African slaves, convicts constituted the second largest body of immigrants ever to be forcibly transported to America. So we have 50,000 convicts. And do you know where they went? Washington, D.C. <laughs> I'll take a minute for that one. Thank you. <laughs> Traders considered convicts a commodity to be bought and sold on the open market. And most felons, however, were nonviolent offenders. And what we're going to see here now is a really interesting premise for how Australia was populated. 98% of the people who were sentenced to transportation, which is what they called the trip to Australia, they called it transportation. How's it, how nice is that? They were found guilty of nonviolent crimes such as theft or forgery. Many colonists resented the government for sending them the people in the United States were very angry with them sending Britain, sending all of these convicts to the United States. So despite the attempts to stop these uh, convicts on the transports, Britain continued to ship them, continued to send the, the least desirable people. And now consider to think what this did to the mentality of the people who wanted to form a new society in the United States. This is really the fuel for the fire now that continues to enrage them against the British crown because, hey, we want to have a good life here. You've sent us over here as a shopkeeper. You sent us over as a blacksmith. And now afterwards, you keep sending all these convicts and I want to get married. I want to have children. I want to send them to schools. We want to have a good life here. How can we do that if you keep sending all these undesirable people over well, it's so it led to the American Revolution as one of the causes for the American Revolution and resulting in a new American nation in 1783. And so after the Americans declared their independence, Britain realized, hey, you know what? We got to find a new place to send all of our convicts now. We can't keep sending them to the United States anymore. So the east coast of Australia had been mapped and claimed for Britain by Captain James Cook 13 years earlier, and now it was Joseph Banks who decided that this would be the ideal place to ship undesirable subjects of the British Empire. In May 1787, the first fleet of 11 ships started their 16,000 mile towards Botany, journey towards Botany Bay, and over the next 80 years, a total of 158,000 convicts were sent to Australia. Can you even imagine that large of number of people being sent? And it seems as though the, the, the criminal system, the justice system, was unable to manage and process this large number of people. But Britain had ulterior motives. The convicts were mostly young, and this was not a coincidence. If you're going to start a successful new community, in a foreign land, it's probably not a good idea to send guys who are in the last stages of their life, in their 40s and 50s. So they sent the youngest people from the prison, com from the prison population. In fact, the majority were between the ages of 16 to 25, with some as young as 11. By a ratio of more than six to one, men outnumbered convict women. So now they're starting to effectively seek certain types of people to go to Australia, to find them guilty of crimes, whether they were guilty or not, small crimes, and to remove those people from the population and to put them on the transport. The majority of the people who were transported were from the United Kingdom. More than half were English, a third from Ireland, and Scott Scotland contributed a few thousand, but they came as far away as Canada, Sri Lanka, uh, Kenya, other, even uh, Malta. These involuntary immigrants brought with them an incredible array of skills and talents. And now we see how this is all being put together. Let's find young people who are skilled and who are able to read and write 
So effectively, Britain was sending some of the most talented and brightest people from their population because consider at this time, the majority of the British population did not know how to read or write. So a separate a thousand separate occupations are identified in official records reflecting a cross-section of the British workforce. Convicts, as I mentioned, were better, better educated than the working class left at home. So we see here that they wanted this colony to be a success and that this became less about shipping undesirables than shipping some of the most desirable people to make this a place that would succeed because Britain couldn't afford to have this new land be a failure. Kidnapping, murder, and sedition would get you a ticket to Botany Bay. These were the ones who were often imprisoned when they arrived at the rocks in Botany Bay. But a one-way ticket to Australia could be earned by opening up your place of amusement on a Sunday, stealing a handkerchief, or holding a debate on Holy Scripture. Any one of these would put you on the transport ship bound for Australia. So they were looking for anyone and everyone they could to fill those ships. People have talked and written about harsh beatings and constant cruelty. However, for many who arrived in Australia, the land that they found and the treatment that they received was far better than the land they had left behind. Convicts were sometimes assigned to work for free for people, but some of these people who had not been um, sent for very criminal purposes could even work for themselves. They would never be chained they would often be able to work for people that they liked, and sometimes they would even be able to learn a new trade. They were only assigned to work for five and a half days, which was 56 hours each week. That seems like an awful lot for some of us, but considering how most people in Britain worked at that time, they actually had a, a less of a work schedule than the majority of people, the working class in Britain at their time, who worked from sunrise to sunset each day. And interestingly, the convicts could also start their own businesses on the side and make their own money without having to pay any taxes. So they could work, then start, use their trade that they learned to start to build their own business. And oftentimes with the money that they were able to receive, they were able to invest this and buy land outside of the city. So they were able to start to build and colonize and the British Empire knew and understood this. They knew that these people would be very interested in building new lives for themselves. A reasonable life combined with the prospect that convicts would receive their own land became the Australian dream for many. One of the governors at the prisons reported that 19 out of 20 are glad to go to Australia and another one said that 99 out of 100 are very desirous of going. So this was the prison yard that they faced uh, in the London prisons. Imagine, wouldn't you want to go to Australia as well? You're paying to go, hell. In 1837, Governor Bork said, in New South Wales, by the aid of convict labor, the industrious and skillful settlers have, within a period of 50 years, converted a wilderness into a fine and flourishing colony. And by this time, more than two-thirds of the male workforce was a convict or ex-convict, and more than 80% of Australians at this time, of these men, chose to make Australia their home. So after having been there for a period of time, they chose not to return home. Now we'll talk briefly about the outback. Hopefully some of you will have a chance to visit the outback, but for many of you who will be continuing on with the cruise, you might not have a chance to see the outback in person. Australia's coastal lands are very well documented. It's where 95% of Australians live. But the outback is a different story altogether. This refers to 73% of Australia's territory, more than 2 million square miles, dotted with less than 5% of its 23 million people. So it would be about having the same, about half of the United States or Europe, with about 800,000 people. So it's a huge, huge space with very, very few people. And you can see here in the center area, 
this area that says that it's mostly unexplored. People have gone through there, but most of this area has not been charted still today. Indigenous Australians, the Aborigines, have lived in the outback for approximately 50,000 years and have occupied almost all of these regions, including the driest deserts. Many indigenous Australians still retain very strong links, spiritual and physical links to this land, even though many of them have moved to the cities. Early European exploration of inland Australia was sporadic. Most of these people settled in the coastal regions. And the lack of industrial land use has made this, industrial, this uh, outback area one of the most intact natural areas on the earth. Outback Australia is one of the world's largest natural areas, along with the boreal forests and tundra regions in North America, the Sahara, and the Gobi deserts, as well as the Amazon rainforest, this space is protected and valued for what it gives back to the earth. The savanna or the grassy woodlands of, Nor of Northern Australia are the largest savanna regions in the world. Here, you can't help but see kangaroos. If you go out, you will see kangaroos by the thousands and by the tens of thousands, easy within eyesight even. In the south, the Great Western Woodlands, which occupy 16 million hectares, an area larger than all of England and Wales, are the largest remaining temperate woodlands on Earth. These are amazing things when we consider how important Australia is to the Earth itself. Original culture, Aboriginal culture, has been at home in the outback for 50,000 years. However, as of 2016, the majority, 81% of all Aboriginal people, now live in the cities. So it's part of the ongoing myth that people continue to believe about Australia is this idea that the Aborigines still live in the outback, and they simply do not live in large numbers anymore in the outback. Most Aborigines now live in the city. For those of you who are going to be going out into the outback, please read this sign carefully. Be numbered amongst, do not be numbered amongst those who have perished in this area due to the lack of preparedness. And when you see why, it takes a special kind of person to live in the outback. Life is hard and it's unforgiving. It's a place of harsh beauty. It's more beautiful than one can imagine for a desert, but you have an overwhelming sense of being completely alone. The temperatures are extreme. It can be 100 to 130 degrees Fahrenheit during the day, and it can go to freezing at night. So you thought you had problems dressing for this cruise and packing? Imagine. The roads are in awful condition, and some of them can't even be classified as roads. I love it when you get out in some areas, and you see it go from a solid line to a dot, 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 dash, 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 and then to a nothingness. And that's for real what happens in the outback of Australia. You need to know how to change your tire, how to fix your tire, and you should probably pack in the back of your car at least a couple of extra tires if you're going out for any length of time into the outback. How's that for animal signs? No deer crossing signs there, just the camels, the kangaroo, and the wallaby. The native, what, I'm sorry? Wombat, I'm sorry, thank you very much. Wombat, the wallabies are the little kangaroos, right? Right. The native fauna can kill you, and it may be one to three days to get to the nearest hospital. At night, the stars are more brilliant than can be described, and it's so quiet at times that you can hear a car coming from a mile away. Imagine. Visiting the outback is like stepping back in time. People are more than happy to see you, glad to greet a stranger but your nearest neighbor may be more than a 30-minute drive away. So it makes the importance and the reliance and friendships and relationships even more important in the outback. And this is one of the things that I loved about my time in the outback, is that beer in some respects, although it's not true, is more valuable than water. If you need something, it's valuable to have a couple of cases of beer in the back of your car because it acts as currency. That if you need help with something or if you need some supplies, you can give this. It's never asked, but it's always expected to give if you're receiving something from someone. Outback pubs are some of the most interesting places in the world. They're considered to be largely lawless because 
You won't find a police officer probably within a couple hundred miles, uh, but it's very safe. People love going to the pubs, and if you get a chance to do that, you can spend a few hours there and never get tired of being in one of these pubs. While you're driving in the outback, uh, it's expected for you to wave to people. Everyone will wave back at you. Uh, nobody will drive past a breakdown. So if you're stranded on the side of the road, uh, in most other parts of the world, you might find some problems, but not here in Australia. People will gladly stop, help you out with whatever your problems are, and even help you make calls if they have a satellite phone with them. They can seem like they're unrefined and even coarse, but in my experience of having spent some time there, they're probably some of the most lovely people I've ever spent time with. It's imp especially important when you're in the outback to have a reliable form of communication because most forms of communication will, will, not, will not work there. So you have to have a form of radio or satellite phone as you're traveling. If you need medical care, your medical care is always a flight away with the flying, Royal Flying Doctor Service. So this is how most people in the outback receive their medical care, the emergency medical care. Uh, so many people have to be trained for immediate care, for snake bites, for other types of animal conflicts. But if you're able to have the time and you're able to get picked up, you can actually get a flight back to, the, uh, to a major hospital through the Royal Doctors Medical Service. Supplies are often very difficult to get because it might be a two or three day drive from wherever you're at in the outback to get to any city. city. So you have to make sure that you have enough fuel or food or supplies handy for you to last. And if you're in a town, you might not even have electricity for large periods of time. And if you're outside of the city, you definitely don't have electricity unless you have a generator. So you have to be constantly measuring your fuel supplies to make sure that you have enough to keep your food and your water. Drinking water is often sourced from rainwater tanks, which as you can imagine in the middle of a desert is very difficult. Education, many people ask, how do these kids who live out here, how do generations continue to flourish in the outback? Well, many children receive their education through the school of the air. So children were actually, in the past, you, when I was out there, they would be on the radio and they would be talking to their teachers this way. Now it's all done on the internet and teachers are able to check their students' homework in real time very, uh, via the internet. A few times a year, these kids get together with all of their friends and pals and their teachers to talk about schoolwork and to have this social interaction, which is so important. I was fortunate to uh, spend a bit of time uh, in the outback, and this was a picture that's taken uh, on the way out to Broken Hill. And what I can tell you is on that long trip through the night, we were woken multiple times by thumps on the car, on the bus. And when we got out of the, the bus in the morning, he had huge metal bars in the front of this bus, right? And it looked like a scene from a horror movie because along this road is where all the humidity comes down at night, right? And on the regular land, this gets soaked into the plants. But on the road, it would sit for a little bit of time, and so the animals would come out to the road to lick the pavement. So you'd see the kangaroos, you would see the wallabies, you would see the, um, uh, even the birds, these gold, beautiful eagles would be down licking the pavement. And so in the morning, he advised us that we had killed approximately 12 kangaroos and about 22 eagles during the night along the road. And it was just a mess. But that's common, and there's, there are just so many of them that they couldn't possibly stop or, or to care for those animals along the way. I was able to spend a little bit of time with some opal miners in White Cliffs, and we actually lived for a short period of time. They build their houses underground as they're mining. So they finish one shaft, and then they'll go into the next one, and then what they might do is bring some of their, their bedding down, they'll make it a little bit smooth, they'll paint it, maybe even put in a, a little tube with a, a, a light for the outside, and that's their home. And so you continue to walk down these shafts and turning and bending every which way to get into these homes, uh, and they have big water tanks on the outside that supply them with all of their water from the rain. 
For those of you who are going to be in, in Sydney for a little bit of time, you might have a chance to drive out to Silverton. It's probably one of the closest areas to get to the outback. Uh, but it's uh, one of the sites of where, you've see, if you've seen Mad Max, the long stretch of road on Mad Max, you can actually sit in the middle of that road for about 30 or 45 minutes, and there won't be a single car that will bother you on that road. Uh, also, Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, for those of you who haven't seen that movie, a fantastic uh, movie that also took place uh, in the outback of Australia. I'm going to share with you some amazing facts about Australia before we close. Did you know that the Australian Alps, the, the Australian Alps get, actually get more snow than the Swiss Alps? It's amazing for most people, but it's actually quite true that they get a larger amount of snow accumulation in one year, and it's a mecca for snow and skiing enthusiasts. 90% of Australians live on the coast. Tasmania has the cleanest air in the world. So for those of you who are looking for a place to spend some time and to retire, Tasmania is probably one of the most beautiful places. I, I hold Tasmania and New Zealand uh, as probably neck and neck for the most beautiful place on earth. The Great Barrier Reef is visible from space and is the largest ecosystem in the world. It's comprised of over 2,500 uh, other reefs. Australia has over six separate wine region. So for those of you who like your wine, Australia is a wonderful place. And most of you already know this because uh, if you're wine connoisseurs, you enjoy some of the Australian wines. Fraser Island is the largest sand island in the world. This is my favorite place in the entire country. If you get a chance to take a few days to go to Fraser Island, I remember being incredulous when someone told me, you know, you can go in the small pools and the rivers on this island and you can drink the water as you swim. And we did just that. The water is that beautiful and that pure. And I remember waking up one morning, we heard these incredible vibrations on the land. And I couldn't figure out what it was. And we all went out, it was about 4 o'clock, 4.30 in the morning. And we went to the beach and there was this huge group of wild mustangs running up and down the beach. And it was just a remarkable place. So if you get a chance to, to visit Fraser Island, uh, please do. This is also a place where you can sing, see some of the last remaining dingoes in Australia. Say what you will about the big fence in the southern part of the United States. Australia's already got you beat. This is the longest fence in the world, and it's meant to keep dingoes out and away from the livestock of Australia. So it's meant to protect the flocks of sheep. 80% of the animals are unique, they are endemic, to Australia. So from cuddly marsupials, everyone thinks they're cuddly till you hold one of them, and then their claws go right into you. They're not so cuddly at that point. Uh, but there's a lot, a lot of animals that are endemic to Australia, an incredible variety. And if you want to see them, I really encourage you to hire a guide. Uh, it's very easy to see the, uh, the kangaroos. It's much more difficult uh, to see the, uh, to, to see the um, koalas. And I'm going to close with a fun video because that's just what I do. This is a great video that talks about North Queensland in Australia. I hope you enjoy Welcome it. Welcome to North Queensland, Australia. Fancy a swim in a tropical paradise? You can't do that here because there's crocodiles. Oh, but don't worry, they've made a sign. You'd think there'd be signs everywhere in this tourist hotspot, right? Nah, there's just the one. And some beaches don't even have any because they mainly just use word of mouth around here. Oh, apparently there's massive prehistoric beasts out there, so just take care. What? <laughs> She'll be right. No, but your safety is important, so tourists are advised to remain at least 10 metres from the water's edge because no crocodile is going to walk 11 metres for a meal, right? As a bonus, they've also got stingers. Doesn't sound too bad though, right? Well actually, stingers is just Australian for the most deadly marine animal known to mankind. But, you know, stingers is a good name too. I mean, it's like calling crocodiles nibblers. Oh, but they've already got a nickname for them. They've taken the term saltwater crocodiles, dispensed with the more integral part of the term, you know, crocodiles, to leave a vague colloquialism that could be used to describe literally any marine animal. 
So if you're paddling in the shallows and a local notifies you that there's some salties round, don't just assume he's talking about dolphins or some form of innocuous mollusk, because actually he's referring to giant flesh-eating reptiles. But don't let just this dissuade you. They've got other stuff too. Like the oldest tropical rainforest in the world. Oh, just be careful of deadly snakes and spiders. Oh, and this bird that may as well be a velociraptor. Clever girl. Queensland, Australia. The best part is, you'll only need to pay a one-way fare because chances are, you won't return. All right, everyone, with that in mind, have a great time exploring Australia. We'll see you at the next lecture. Thank you.